So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Rhiannon Rosalind and I am the CEO of the Economic Club of Canada. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you here today. Thank you. Thanks. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here today for this very important discussion and this really is a capstone for us because we've had a long event season and this is one of our last events of the season and I think it's the perfect way to close um, and to end this chapter and really to think about what's next. What's next in terms of the conversation that we need to have here in Canada. I want to start by letting you know that I'm getting excited in a couple of weeks I'm traveling to Wikwemakong First Nation. Um, this is a community that we've done a lot of work with through the Economic Club and Junior Economic Club. I'm going to speak and be a part of their uh, business summit. Last summer we actually brought a group of young students um, to Wikwemakong First Nation and we brought these young Indigenous uh, youth and non-Indigenous youth together to tackle issues around truth and reconciliation. And we gave them the power, them the opportunity to come together and to ideate and to create. And then they actually got to come travel back to Toronto and address this very platform. Young students talking about the ideas that they have for a better country. To me, that is what truth and reconciliation is about. To me, in my position as a leader in this country, I think it's very important that I continue to learn and to open my heart up to um, the people that have been here first. And so with that said, I want to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered here today on the traditional territory of the Wendat, the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Métis, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. So thank you so much for gathering on this land and for this very important conversation. I want to thank our annual partners that are in the room today, PwC of course. I want to thank Music Canada. It's always a pleasure to work with you. I want to thank our advisory board member uh, that's in the room today, Linda Maxwell. I call her a badass. That's generally what I say. Um, but she's a surgeon and she's the executive director of the biomedical zone at Ryerson University in St. Mike's. It's really an honor to work with you, Linda, an honor to have you here. I want to big up our new president, Darius Sukram. Um, Darius is here. So many of you have seen me at the helm of this organization for almost a decade now. I can't do this all alone. I have an incredible team, but Darius has come on to serve as president and I'll continue on as CEO. And it's amazing to have somebody who has a vision for how we can build more deep and authentic conversations in this country. So hello to Darius. MP DeBruzen is here today. Yes. Um, MP Julie de Bruzen is here today, who is my home uh, member of parliament uh, for Toronto Danforth, and it's an honor to have you be a part of this very important conversation. So, thank you so much for being here. So, anyone who knows me knows that I'm pretty passionate about this country and I'm pretty passionate about conversations. Conversations, I think, in storytelling can change, change everything. Right now, we are at a time of great challenge around the world and here in Canada. We have to adjust and we have to adapt. When we look at the disruption that's coming at us in all forms, and it's not just technology, we look at mass labor market changes that are coming our way. Um, we look at automation, climate change, and demographic shifts. We look at inequality and what I would say is the mass need for mass reconciliation. Not just reconciliation with our indigenous peoples, which is so important, reconciliation with people of color, reconciliation with women, with men, reconciliation between creators and corporate. We need reconciliation. We need to come together. We need to unify. Right now the buzzword, and in my world it's all about the buzzwords and we follow those trends of what people want to talk about. Right now everyone wants to talk about the future of work. The skills gap. They want to talk about what this fourth, re fourth industrial revolution will bring. And to me, in my mind, the answer is in this room. The answer in my mind is human compassion. The answer is creativity and the convergence of art and business. The answer is human emotion and the power of our hearts. And the answer is calling for us to be more human to remind ourselves of how we are interconnected, to remind ourselves of how the creative needs to converge with all of the places and spaces that don't have that room right now for creativity. If we are going to innovate, if we are going to cultivate something new, we have to come together in a very, very different way. And I think that nobody understands that more than our guest speaker today, Graham Henderson. It's such an honor and a pleasure always to host you. You know I mean that from my heart. 
And I think that you're doing a very, very important job here in Canada of having this conversation, speaking about it in the way that, you know, this is an economic conversation. Our creators in the room, you know you're a part of the new economy in such an important way, even more than I think that we ever realized before. So creativity, innovation, heart, emotional intelligence, these are the skills of today and tomorrow, and you own and hone them. So thank you for being here in this room. And with that said, I just want to give it over to Graham um, and let him take us on this beautiful journey and this conversation. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Graham Henderson, President and CEO of Music Canada. Um, uh, those of you who've uh, seen me speak in the past will know that I always find a way to work uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley, the English romantic poet, into my speeches. And I wasn't going to do it, and I realized today I don't have to because I had a poet introduce me. That was beautiful, Rhiannon. Thank you. Um, this morning when I woke up, a, a dear friend of mine uh, who now lives in Los Angeles, Erica Savage, who's known to many of you folks in the room, sent me a little note, and it was... Um, uh, a throwback to my past. Uh, uh, I left private practice. I worked for recording artists for many years, and uh, I went to work for Universal Music Canada, and uh, who my friends over there. And uh, she sent me a little clip that appeared in the newspaper uh, when uh, called Exec Shuffle, which announced my new job. It said Graham Henderson has been tapped by Universal Music Canada as senior VP for Business Affairs and Commerce. In his new position, Henderson will head the legal staff at Universal and be responsible for distribution, licensing, publishing, and production-related agreements. He will also be in charge of online music. <laughs> so you have me to frickin' blame. <laughs> in charge of online music. Whew. Um, well, uh, so thank you all. Uh, I mean, I'm looking out here, there's so many friends here today. Um, I obviously want to acknowledge uh, my, my members. We have a table of good friends from Universal Music and Sony Music and Warner Music. Uh, our chair, Jennifer Sloan, there she is there today. Thank you so much. Uh, an amazing, amazing collection. We've got artists in the room. There are three uh, tables of students, uh, and there's, I think, two from Humber. Where are you, Humber? Humber! So, uh, and Uni University of Toronto music program. Where are you? There you are. So, um, we felt it was very important uh, to have you in the room uh, because you're our future. Uh, and those of you who are going forward into careers in music or, or film or television or whatever it is, um, we feel an obligation uh, to build a, a world uh, in which you can earn a living as professionals in your chosen profession. So thank you for coming. I hope what you find is useful. Um, all right, well, we're here today to release Music Canada's new report. Uh, we call it Closing the Value Gap how to fix safe harbors and save the creative middle class. But before we get there, I'd like to cast a glance back to how we got here. The last time I uh, appeared at the Economic Club was in 2016. I spoke about uh, the broken promises of the golden age. Now, at that time, the main theme of our first value gap report, uh, were, those themes were all in place. Uh, but we hadn't yet put a name to the phenomenon that we now call the value gap. Put simply, the value gap is a concept we use to describe the gulf between the revenues that third parties receive from their exploitation of creative content and the money they pay to creators. Artists, journalists, businesses, authors, you name it. Third parties, like user upload services. Third parties, like YouTube. Third parties with more money than God. In 2016, the issues and solutions at play weren't as well defined as they are today. And the creative community just wasn't as unified. Moreover, this was a time before Cambridge Analytica, 
before Russian interference in elections via social media, before we were aware of massive data breaches and the extent to which our private lives are surveyed. It was before we realized the extent to which Silicon Valley and big tech might not just be as friendly as we thought. Many of you, I think, were here in the room that day. Uh, and if you were, I hope you would remember what my core message was. Despite what creators were promised by tech companies and their promoters in the early 2000s, the digital era did not usher in a utopia in which artists, freed from the middleman, would earn more money by connecting directly with consumers. But there was no golden age. And instead, artists saw career opportunities implode as tech behemoths took an ever greater slice of a shrinking pie. And after they were finished with the creators, you know the story, they came for the journalists. And we are now living in that near dystopian environment. But that speech in 2016 was just part of a grand movement that was getting underway here in Canada. And perhaps most crucially, artists found their voices and began actively speaking out against the destruction of a way of life. Many do, drew a direct and unsettling connection between seemingly bland exceptions in the Copyright Act and their personal financial challenges. Many spoke openly about how those exemptions denied them royalty payments that might make the difference between life as a professional creator or life as a hobbyist. And the recharacterization of these exceptions as subsidies, well, that was like a tectonic shift. And I honestly think some politicians and policymakers were thunderstruck by this, by the idea that every single time government creates an exception to the requirement to pay money for the use of creative works, they create a direct subsidy. And now people are looking at who the primary recipients of these subsidies are. And people are getting uncomfortable. People are starting to say, enough is enough. Now, our 2017 report, The Value Gap, Its Origins, Impacts, and a Made in Canada Approach, uh, went on to become something of a handbook for copyright reform in Canada. I'm proud to say that it played a role in rallying the community around a call for the end to subsidies. And I would like to think that it emboldened artists, that it actually influenced parliamentary studies. And hopefully we'll hear more about that later from Julie. But what I will say is this. What we've achieved would simply not have been possible if we hadn't worked together. And where our unity came into very clear focus was actually at the parliamentary hearings. Because it was there that the artists hit their stride. Artists like Davnet Doyle caught the attention of MPs. At the Heritage Committee, here's one of the things she said. Quote, I sit here today not getting paid, but paying for after school childcare, so that I can paint a vivid picture about the hard truths of the poverty affecting creators today. I wish I could use the term middle class, but the middle class of creators has been eviscerated. I know only one musician in Toronto who has bought a house in the last 10 years. Most cannot pay their rent, let alone go to the dentist." End quote. Davna crystallized for policymakers an unsettling truth of our internet era. The creative middle class is being annihilated. Artists advocating change were often criticized for asking the government to turn the clock back. In one memorable exchange, an artist retorted to a government official making such a suggestion, that far from wanting the clock turned back, she wanted the legislative clock turned forward 
She wanted our laws rebalanced to reflect our real experience of the digital environment. She wanted laws that had been designed before anybody had even heard of social media updated. Personal stories like this about the very real consequences of the value gap dominated the copyright review hearings. And based on these accounts and on other evidence, the Heritage Committee, chaired by Julie de Bruzen, produced an extraordinary report called Shifting Paradigms. And I recommend it to every single person in this room. It's a name that perfectly captures the need to overhaul the rules governing the online market for creative works. In its report tabled last month, the Heritage Committee advanced creative solutions for the 21st century. Its members clearly understood the need to rebalance the Copyright Act. The committee was clearly responding to evidence in front of them, including, I might add, evidence from Silicon Valley acolytes who argued that everything was just fine and that the changes to Copyright Act asked for by creators would, cue the eye roll, break the internet. In the face of unified testimony from creators, those claims were simply deemed to be no longer credible. The time for rebalancing was clearly here and the committee responded. They responded with concrete recommendations that will reinvigorate, if enacted, the creative economy. And we in the creative community are fortunate that the Heritage Committee was so decisive and forward-looking. So thank you. This brings me back to our purpose today, which is to set our sights on what's next. Now, in a perfect world, the Heritage Committee's recommendations would be implemented without delay. They would constitute a roadmap for the next stage in the evolution of the digital environment, a world in which, God forbid, gigantic technology companies are actually regulated, and that transparency and platform accountability are introduced into our world. However, a hurdle lies before us, and that's the October federal election. The timing of this election creates a pause, which in turn is creating uncertainty for all of us. The changes called for in the report require legislation, and that must now wait. But we are at a moment in time, a cusp of sorts. We have momentum. We have the moral high ground. And we have an immense opportunity in front of us. But if we don't seize the initiative now, it is possible that some of these advantages could seep away. The Germans, as usual, have a word for moments like this. They call it Schwerpunkt, or the point of maximum effort, where a decisive result can be achieved. But we need to grasp this opportunity. The timing is perfect, almost. We're ready. But clearly, hurdles do remain. For example, the Industry Canada report. And in mentioning it, I almost feel like I should cue music from Jaws or something like that. That report was, how shall I put it, disappointing? And some great work has been done by folks like John Deegan uh, in our audience today and Hugh Stevens to unearth the peculiar forces at work in the creation of that report. And I'm sure more revelations will follow. Suffice, for our purposes, suffice to note that the committee failed to recognize the need for concerted action on the value gap. A baffling result considering the weight of evidence in front of them. It almost represents to me like a call from the past, recycling tired and shop-worn notions about the role of tech in our culture, almost as if Cambridge Analytica had never happened. 
But even more peculiarly, the committee willfully and openly, flagrantly, disregarded the Heritage Report, a report that in effect they'd commissioned. Their exact words were, quote, the committee thanks its colleagues for their contribution. I don't know why I'm doing an English accent. <laughs> I think, I think because when I read this, it's, I, I, thought of a Monty, I thought of a Monty Python skit or something. The committee thanks its colleagues for their contribution and looks forward to consulting their report. The parrot is dead. Um, yeah, or, there, or this could be a Baroness von Sketch. Sketch. Um, well, what did they miss by not reading the report, by not weighing the evidence? Well, here's a goodie. Discussing one of the central asks made by the music community, the government, that the government remove an exemption that prevents Canadian performers and record labels from receiving royalties for the use of their music in film and TV soundtracks. That's what we wanted. Well, the committee concluded that this was not something the performers really want anyway. Now, I personally sat beside a representative from Actra PRS, Laurie McAllister. Laurie, are you in the room? Hey, Lori. I sat beside Lori, and uh, she asked for this specifically uh, on behalf of thousands of performers in her organization. Well, my takeaway is clearly the patriarchy's not dead. Performers, Industry Canada knows what's best for you. The Heritage Committee, on the other hand, heard performers, labels loud and clear, and said, end the subsidies. Let's move on. We're not here to re rehash a report that ignored the evidence. We're here, as I've said, to seize the moment and press ahead, which is why I'm delighted to present our next contribution to maintaining the momentum of our new report. And it's in the tables in front of you. We call it Closing the Value Gap, How to Fix Safe Harbors and Save the Creative Middle Class. The report chronicles the challenges that artists face as a direct result of the value gap. It amplifies the voices of musicians like Andrew Morrison of the Juno-nominated band The Jerry Cans. In a moment of riveting testimony cited prominently in the report, Andrew managed to encapsulate the entire problem. He testified, and I quote, I'm a young artist, and the older generation is telling me about the glory days of their royalty checks. I say, sweet, what's that? I'll buy you a coffee with mine. We also captured the ideas of Ari Posner, one of Canada's most in-demand music composers for film and television. Ari memorably told an economic club audience, quote, potentially we could lose a whole generation of Canadian talent that is not going to be able to make a go of it. Well, artist stories like these have mobilized legislators, legislatures and policymakers to rethink the current regime. But me, me, we at Music Canada also recognize the need to back up these personal accounts with hard numbers. Now, Dr. George Barker, who is an economist with the London School of Economics and Australia National University, he studied the real costs to artists in the industry of the value gap and astonishing numbers emerged. Literally, take your breath away. Dr. Barker estimates that between 1997 and 2017, the cumulative size of the value gap for recorded music, this is money that we should have, not them, he estimated the size of that gap at $19 billion. And that's just Canada. In 2017 alone, third parties walked away with $1.6 billion that properly and fairly belongs on the creative side of the ledger. And the gap is still growing. Even with modest recent gains in recorded music revenues, and they are happening, there's reason for optimism, we're continuing to fall further behind. Dr. Barker also found that were YouTube to pay fair royalties on the music it profits from, half a billion dollars would flood annually from its Silicon Valley treasure chest into the hands of Canadian musicians and record labels. How is that possible? 
Well, it's possible because the royalties paid by YouTube per user, per year, on average, amounts to about 5% of that paid by Spotify. To put that further in perspective, fair pay would double the size of the Canadian music industry overnight. And Dr. Barker identifies the common enemy which allows user upload services like YouTube to underpay artists and thereby contribute so significantly to the value gap. And those are broad safe harbor laws. Now, for the purposes of this speech, all you need to know about safe harbors are that it has nothing to do with boats. <laughs> They're rules that tech companies are relying on to circumvent the need to bargain in good faith with the owners of copyrighted materials. And these rules that they shield behind were actually updated from telephone laws in the 1890s. And they have lived long beyond their shelf life. The result of these rules is that artists and music creators are effectively forced to subsidize big tech. Think about it. Silicon Valley billionaires are getting rich by commercializing music from Canadian performers. Look around you. They're in the room. They're sitting right beside you. MP Randy Boissonneau put it best, I think, when he said during the hearings, quote, we've gone through the wonder of the web. Now we're in an era called the, quote, tyranny of technology, and it's putting a lot of our artists at risk. My concern, he said, is that artists and their work are becoming a utility, and that the technological aggregators are literally becoming the robber barons of the 21st century. Amen. Lack of platform accountability, and you're going to hear a lot more about that in days to come, Lack of platform accountability and rules specifically advantaging user upload platforms like YouTube also create a broader dysfunction in the digital marketplace. Subscription-based models like Spotify and Apple Music, they operate in a competitive marketplace. They must always account for the fact, however, that another platform is offering the same music to consumers for free. This suppresses prices and therefore suppresses the money available to them to distribute to, to, to uh, creators and their partners. In the Heritage Committee, we now have a true champion. And as people get to know more about how big tech gains its vast wealth, uh, people are, public opinion is shifting. It's on our side. The public has come to understand that when something is offered for free in the digital world, the cost is your data, the cost is your privacy, and you, every one of you, are the commodity. And it's for these reasons that I say we are at a critical moment in time. It's why we're talking today about closing the value gap and why we're shining a light on people and events moving us ever closer to our goal, the Heritage Report, and leaders like Julie de Bruzen who listened to the evidence, opened their eyes to the world, and who came to fact-based conclusions. And, of course, it's why we're presenting Music Canada's new report and advancing 21st century solutions to 21st century problems. Copies of our new report have been placed at your table. I encourage you to give it a close read. Rather than recite the recommendations, I will skip ahead to their purpose. Their purpose is to rebalance the music marketplace and to restore fairness to the creators of music. The principle is simple. When third parties like you two make money from the commercialization of music, a fair share should make its way to artists and the businesses that work to create it. Subsidies must end. Copyright law was never intended to shelter trillion dollar multinational Silicon Valley corporations from paying 
for the product they use to make a fuck ton of money from selling advertising. <laughs> yet, yet that is exactly what occurred. The Copyright Act has been weaponized to in effect force creators to subsidize them. We in the music community aren't asking for special treatment or a handout, and we're certainly not looking to break the internet, but what we are insisting on is fairness. So that money that properly and fairly should be in the hands of artists is available to them. To earn a decent living, to buy food, to pay the rent, to put their kids through school, and to record music to give them a shot at entering the middle class. So that money that properly and fairly should be in the hands of record companies is available to them for reinvestment in artists, to build their careers, and to bring more great music to fans. Artists and record companies should not be the 21st century casualties of outdated laws written in the 20th century. After the election, we will be calling on the government to move forward with a sense of urgency. The Heritage Committee's report, and now Music Canada's report, show us the way. And we look forward to continuing to work with each of our music industry colleagues, many of them here in the room today, to reach our shared goal. We are inspired in our call to action, as always, by the artists. Musicians like those sitting amongst us today. Musicians who were brave enough to testify before committees and in the court of public opinion. Musicians like Andrew Cash, who said, and I quote, we love music and we want music to happen. And it can't happen unless artists can make a decent living and be healthy and happy in their lives. Thank you. Uh, Rhiannon, you're gesturing at me. Oh yes. Easy to hear. Yeah. So they're at your table. Write them out. We'll collect them. I'm now going to ask Julie Bruzen to Bruzen to come to the uh, stage, and we are going to spend half an hour uh, chatting. I would go. Yeah, you can do that. Uh, chatting. Uh, and um, we'll do that now. Thanks. That was very good. Thank you. Um, so I, I'll say that I think we are uh, exceedingly lucky to have Julie with us today. Um, it's not usual for, uh, I think, this sort of uh, give and take to happen. Uh, so soon after a report, um, but um, uh, I, I, it gives us a chance uh, to maybe uh, sort of look under the hood <laughs> and come to an understanding of, of your own journey, um, because I think it's an interesting one. Um, how, how do you go from where it began to the uh, authoring of a report like that? And I think that people would be very interested to know what that journey was like. And, and it was interesting because when, when, when you, you raised, raised that question, it, it brings me to how there's been a bit of a full circle because the economic club had a meeting a couple of years ago yeah. and, and that's when, and I think we should give a bit of a shout out to Miranda Mulholland, I'm looking at her right now, um, she spoke and, and she spoke very, very forcefully mm -hmm. about the value gap and, and where it was most forceful was that it brought up her personal journey, the stories of other artists who she knew. And so it wasn't just a dry matter of fact on a piece of paper anymore. 
It was hearing the actual impact that was happening in our communities and in people's lives. And that was the first time that perhaps I'd even twigged a bit more carefully to those issues. And so I believe that Minister of Heritage, was at the time Melanie Jolie, came right. to committee only shortly after that. And I said, when, when are we looking at this Copyright Act mm -hmm. review? So it, th that was the beginning of the journey in many ways. And I have to say it was throughout the artists and the artists who came and, and like you pointed out, mm -hmm. several of them. Yeah. Uh, they, they really were the ones who pushed it forward by opening up and sharing their stories. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think that's uh, certainly that was what we noticed, um, that there seemed to be a ground shift. But uh, I also think it shouldn't be lost on us that that was not easy. Um, and I, I remember very well, you know, um, Miranda and others talking about, um, you know, the, the how, how telling the real, telling the story of what life is really like is actually contrary to what, you know, everything that you're taught. It's supposed to be perfect. It's supposed to be shiny. Uh, it's a social media world on Instagram and Twitter. So it, it's, it's a difficult tale to tell and not easy. No, and, 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 and that's, that's perhaps where my greatest appreciation is, truly, when I, when I look around. The, the artists who came to committee and shared their stories, and they talked about Navi Doyle, uh, mm -hmm. different individuals, um, Andrew Morrison, talking about this is, this is how my life has changed, and it, it isn't all that picture-perfect thing that I would maybe like to put out and have everyone see, mm -hmm. but it's time that you see it, because without telling those stories, and we couldn't really figure out how do we move forward. But I guess in talking about all of that, mm -hmm. because now we have um, Closing the Value Gap yeah. report, mm -hmm. And, uh, oh, by the way, can I just point out, I love the fact that it has graphic comic yeah, yeah. book at the back. Yeah. So you should all check that out. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, you have that, you have the Heritage Report. Mm -hmm. How are you going to use that to, to move mm -hmm. forward on the policy basis? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a great question. Uh, I, my, my view um, is that, uh, let, let's talk first about your report. And I think, I don't think we can say enough today about how important that report is, not just domestically, but internationally. Um, when I, I was in Europe when it was released, uh, and it created something of a sensation um, a, a, in the sort of creative community, it's like, sorry, wait, what? Uh, you know, the government of Canada, or like an official committee of a government is recognizing that there's a value gap, is recognizing that we need to fix it, and is actually, and, and I heard people say things like, it almost reads like a handbook to fix the internet. <laughs> If we just did this, the internet would be fixed. Um, and so, so yeah, well, so maybe, maybe a few other things, but uh, I, I, I certainly, that was, that was how I viewed it. And so for me, uh, your report becomes an essential tool in the toolkit to demonstrate that um, people believe us now. Mm -hmm. Like a, you know, official government committee here in Canada, they believe us, they buy it, they get it. Uh, and uh, they uh, are um, interested in proposing change. So it's important domestically, obviously, because um, you know it'll it'll form uh, a uh, a foundation uh, for our next steps. Clearly, um, we were like most people in the room here today who who cared about the creative space. We were watching the committee hearings, we were listening to the committee hearings, hearing what you heard, and I can tell you that the, the testimony that you heard, well, it also influenced our report. Interesting. Um, so, you know, we, we couldn't write a report not taking into account the fact that this very important thing had happened. So it's a foundation for us going forward. Uh, I think it establishes a benchmark which can also be leveraged in international settings. And I'll give you one example. Uh, we were at uh, WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization. We were doing a presentation to the Standing Committee on Copyright and Related Activities. Uh, we did a little side event. Uh, Miranda was part of that. Uh, but in talking to the Director General, it was like, here's a report from Canada. You've got to read this because they get it. And there's not a lot of people around the world who get it and have said it the way that you do. So it can't... It's, if I can jump sure. in, I find it so surprising when you say that because it seemed so obvious right. from the testimony that we were hearing. Yeah. So that's, that's why I, I, it's a little bit jarring to me when I hear that because it was so clear. I mean, I believe we had um, Debussy, who was, not, uh, was mm -hmm. also a musician who came and showed us 
just the, the amount of money that he was making now for the same songs even in places mm -hmm. uh, and as over time everyone was so clear and, yeah. and so it's, it's just surprising to me when I hear Well, I, I think that, that what we have to face, all of us, is that um, when a report like yours comes out, uh, there's sometimes an equal and opposite reaction, industry report being one of them, mm -hmm. but also too that the, uh, the people who have our money and want to keep our money, they're very effective, they've got a lot of money uh, and they're going to leverage that to maintain the status quo and one of the key messages that they persist in delivering uh, to uh, governments and policymakers is, no, you, everything's fine. Like, you don't want to do anything because it'll break the internet and there won't be any more free speech. Uh, and, uh, you know, we had the, the, the farce in the EU uh, of, of kids being bombarded with emails from YouTube, warning them in effect that the, you know, the internet was almost coming to an end. And there were thousands of kids, there were these great like, anecdotal stories of kids who were actually signing off the internet, bye Mary, goodbye Tim, we'll never be on the internet again. <laughs> Uh, no more memes, no more anything. All of which, of course, was just not true. So there's, there's, a, there's a gigantic fake news, uh, if I can call it that, a factory that is working against us that wants to perpetuate it. Mm. They've got the money. They want to keep the money. Yeah, well, that's too bad to hear. Yeah. yeah. So um, what I guess I would ask you, um, you know, there's a lot of artists in the room. You sat, we, we've got another stage to go through, right? Mm -hmm. what, what's your advice? Uh, where, where do you think we need to go? Um, like the people in this room, artists, labels, people who work in the industry, what's next? Um, um, in, a, in a lot of ways, my perspective is uh, that it's important to keep telling the individual stories. It, it's what changes things. We, you, you always share the data that you have. That's important. Yeah. But, but bring life to that data so that people can really see what it is. Mm -hmm. And really don't es underestimate the value of reaching out to your local MPs. You know, time and time again, I'm sorry, I'm kind of facing you guys backwards here. Um, but time and time again, you'll see that people will be writing to ministers about mm. different issues or wanting to meet with ministers. But your local MPs, it's their job to represent their communities and to have artists in the community come up to them. You know, when, when artists come into my office and they talk to me and they share their stories and they tell me the impacts that they have, that, that is very motivating and it explains things. It really helps you know, if they bring in the Heritage Committee report, if they bring in this report and say, have you looked at this? Yeah. These are some good recommendations and this is why. This is the impact it's having on my life. This is how it would change my life. Mm -hmm. Really, really don't underestimate that value. Write, even just write an email. If you don't have the time to have a meeting, mm -hmm. write an email, call an office. Just make sure that you can write to the ministers as well, but reach out to your local MPs in every case so that they hear that as well. And um, what about, like, what are the legislative next steps? I mean, just, just imagine status quo. Uh, there wasn't an election. What, like, what, what, or we come back and it's the way it is. What would the, what would, you, you've got these two competing reports, what, what would happen? Uh, the two competing reports, I'll point out, our report was the one that looked at remuneration of artists. So the industry committee was an overall report, mm -hmm. but we were tasked specifically to look at the issue of remuneration of artists, and that was what our report focused on, and we did hear from you know, competing points of views yeah. in, in drafting that. So it's the more specific. I'm a lawyer, so I always kind of do, you know, yeah. you have the general provisions and then you have yeah. the specific one. Specific one always governs. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I, I would say that that's, that's the one that should carry the day as far as that piece on, on those parts of the copyright right. review. But then it really, you're, you're correct, most of it has to be legislated. Mm -hmm. It's not a matter of just policy. Um, so that would require government legislation to be tabled. And does it go to a government, uh, I mean, so does it go to a, uh, a cabinet committee or like where, do, where does the, the, the battle of ideas take place? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it happens there, but don't underestimate also the impact again. I'll bring it back to local MPs. Right. Uh, in, so y you have to do both. Yeah. You have to do both. 
but, but there is a battle that happens within caucus as well of people standing up and, and saying, this is, this is what we need to see done. Yeah. So well, I, 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 all my life, I've, I've believed that. I believe that uh, the power of the caucus is underestimated. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that uh, when we went through the copyright reform process, which seemed to go on forever for anybody. Like it started in 2003 with the Martin government and then went through two Harper minorities, just kept going on and on. But along the way, uh, a uh, retinue, a large retinue of caucus members came on board. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I feel that you know, when the issues came up in caucus, there were people, well, wait a minute. We're, no, we want to help musicians. Or, I, I think it's an important voice. It's an important voice. Um, actually, I just wanted to say the other part, because we were talking about this earlier, yeah, yeah. is the power of education for consumers. Right. You know, I, I would say that when I attended the economic, the economic Club presentation a couple mm -hmm. of years ago, I had no idea in many ways about how YouTube monetizes music mm -hmm. that's played. And, and, and so... I would expect most people would be surprised, and so that's something about how do we get it out, which, which perhaps maybe leads me to ask you the question about how on a practical basis right. can Music, Music Canada help you know, musicians to, to work through these issues? Well, that's, yeah, uh, that's a tough one. Um, the, uh, I mean, first of all, so what, here's one of the things that we're doing. Um, I believe that there is a class of creator in Canada right now that is largely unrepresented almost by anybody and that's the artist entrepreneur mm. and it's, it's, it's a very significant class of people who are you know they're artists who are on their own they're not signed to labels they may run their own label um, you know back in the day you know uh, I worked with Lorena McKennett on a sort of a do-it-yourself model that was not the norm um, and, and Lorena and I very clearly understood if you're going to be your own label, then you have to do this, 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 and this. And she ended up having, I think she had six employees in Stratford and was a major, uh, you know, uh, 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 source of money for the local community, revenue for the community. But today, um, it's not an exception. Uh, everybody's been sort of pushed out. Uh, there's not as many people signed to labels. So what are we doing for artist entrepreneurs? Now, in discussions I've had with the Department of Heritage, they, they recognize that, oh, yeah, well, artist entrepreneurs, we care about artists. Okay, well, what are you doing? Um, and one of the areas that we've noticed is there's a ton of money, not an F ton, but a ton, <laughs> uh, that is spent on educating young tech entrepreneurs. Like, we, we, we think this is important. They need to be educated. They'll go from here to here to here. But nothing is spent on educating creative entrepreneurs. And it, I think it's this big gap. So uh, we have uh, undertaken a study at Music Canada, uh, funded by our members at considerable expense. It's a nationwide study. We've had a, 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 a survey out uh, to, uh, to the community. Um, we got 300 responses uh, almost immediately. It was tremendous. And we're, what we're trying to do is get them to tell us what do they need like, what is it that they're, what training are they lacking? What answers are they lacking? So I think if we can elicit from the community this unrepresented class, if we can elicit from the community good answers, uh, then in partnership with others, we may be able to offer programs. And we've talked to SOCAN about this. They, there are a number of programs, like mm -hmm. Coalition has a program, uh, there are, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and as I say, SOCAN has a program, but maybe there's something we can do in a cohesive fashion, but it also might be a indication to government of a gap. And I know government loves training programs, <laughs> so I think we might have one for you. <laughs> well, no. But but it's a fair point because the way we talk about the creative industries mm -hmm. is, is interesting in the sense that there are two parts to it. We want to have active, you know, a very vibrant Canadian creative industry because that those are our stories and, and that's our our way of seeing ourselves, reflecting ourselves, and growing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So so it, there's an importance there, but it's also an important economic sector mm -hmm. and and we do a disservice to it when we don't talk about that part right. as well yeah i agree so, 
I, I agree with you. And, and I guess there's a role for labels today, too, in, in working with, with the industry and with working yeah, with and creators. I, and, I, and I think that's worth discussing, too, because um, one of the myths promulgated uh, during the past period is that f somehow labels like our friends at Warner, Sony, and Universal, but also independent labels have kind of outgrown their usefulness, that, that really what artists want uh, is just to do it on their own um, and connect directly with consumers and they'll make more money. Um, and so the role of record companies has been uh, questioned. Now, a study was t undertaken by a professor at uh, New York University. Uh, his name's Larry Miller, and we love Larry. Uh, love the Larry. Uh, he did a presentation with us uh, in, uh, in uh, Geneva, actually. And one of the things he said was, you know, so what about the role of labels? He said, well, you know, nothing is different, but everything is different. Um, that is, everything about our industry has changed, yet the core functions of a label haven't. And, and I would say that those functions of, of the folks that we represent are discovering brilliant talent, collaborating with the talent and make music as good as it can be, because it actually is a process of give and take. It's really helpful sometimes to have an editor, whether you're an author or whether you're a musician in the studio. Also, uh, connect the music uh, with the potential for good commercial outcomes. Because right now, that is Mount Everest. Mm. How do we get a good commercial outcome? And labels are very, very good, large and small, at pathfinding that. And then, of course, once there is a good commercial outcome, sharing the largesse with the, uh, with the artists. So I would look at uh, you know, the today's environment, and I, I would say that labels are more relevant than ever, uh, and that uh, you know, economists call it the tyranny of choice. There's just like a, a, a massive amount of choice out there. And people, uh, uh, you know, we've invested in technology that would help us sort of decode and understand that and act as pathfinders. So very valuable role um, for, for labels, uh, I think, still. Um, now, if I could just switch gears, uh, because um, Julie's not only been responsible for uh, a very important study on... Um, uh, on uh, copyright, but you also were part of a report entitled Gender Parity in Canadian Artistic and Cultural Organizations. Yeah. This is something that is hugely important. It's a topic that is roiling the music industry right now. I think all creative industries, I know we at Music Canada are trying to do our best, but could you tell us a little bit about that report and where you see that going? And that was, um, that was an interesting report because in some ways, I have to admit, I was surprised by some of the things that I was hearing in the sense of where were the challenges mm -hmm. when we were talking about it. But then when people said it, it spoke truth to me and frankly in some of my own experiences in life. So when, when people were talking, a lot of what we were hearing is that perhaps it was a willingness. It wasn't that people didn't want more women on their boards, but then they would be looking for certain experience. Mm -hmm. uh, how they listed experience or headhunters would go out and look for them and they would come back and it would just, there wouldn't be any women because they didn't mm -hmm. have what they called the right experience. And a lot of what turned on was how, what we're really looking for are skills in each mm -hmm. case. People bringing certain skills. So it might be that rather than looking for, oh, this person has worked here, 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 therefore outcome here. Instead, we're looking for somebody who has this really great skill set, which is what you need for your board. Mm -hmm. And maybe they come from somewhere a little bit different, but they're going to bring that different talent pool to you. And, and that was the biggest challenge that came up time and time again, is that people who were being recommended for boards, uh, when people were looking out, the, the way that they defined what they were looking for, mm -hmm was just the wrong, they were looking in the wrong places. Right. So, I don't know, like if Music Canada has had to deal with that issue well, as well. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, it's, it's, a, I, I, it's a huge problem. Um, and I, I think the, the, the issue is, I mean, didn't, did, didn't you find there was sort of like a data gap though? Like, yeah, so that was the other part. So one of the things that we recommended is we need to get better yeah. data because in truth, especially when you look at a lot of smaller arts organizations mm -hmm. along the way, we just had no sense. Yeah. No, no, no data collected on, on what was the representation on boards, how they were made up. Yeah. So that is an important part of it too, is to try and get better data so that we can figure out where we need to move forward. Yeah. 
I mean, what if you just said to, um, to uh, cultural organizations that are receiving money from the government, uh, either show me your diversity policy or you don't get any money. Uh, show me, I want to see, I don't want to see a list of names on your board, I want to see the pictures. Yeah. Well, we, we, we talked about, uh, we did talk about that a bit, and did come yeah. up, and there were some, some organizations, the, the question is, what do you call the funding? I mean, you're talking right. about sometimes some people are getting very small, mm -hmm. small grants, right? Yeah. It, it could be, maybe you got Canada summer jobs for one student yeah. or something like that, right? So how do you apply that across the board? Yeah. But absolutely, should we be looking more carefully to make sure that we're encouraged, putting the right incentives yeah. in place for people to have those policies? Yes. Yeah, and, and, may, and maybe it's a matter of uh, just um, sort of issuing a, 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 like a list of best practices. Mm -hmm. All cultural, and we're talking about cultural boards, right? I mean, I'm sure there's lots of people on cultural boards in this room, and uh, frankly, I, I, they're, and not just business boards, they're all white, they're all male, or mostly, uh, and nobody's really doing anything about it. And, and, and I think there's this idea that, oh, well, just wait, it'll happen organically. No, it won't. Um, you know, you've got to act with, and I sometimes think this, that like a government can be a cattle prod. It's like you're not getting any more money. Yeah. Well, and, and, so and you look part like of the community. And, and there is that part as well. Uh, during a right leading up to International Women's Day, I went out and spoke with a lot of local businesses, which is not only in the creative industries, but yeah. spoke with women who headed up local businesses in yeah. the community and asked what were some of the things that would have helped them? What were they looking mm -hmm. for? And interestingly, a lot of them said, you know, setting up better mentorship programs. Right. Yeah. And, and that was one of the recommendations in the report as well, but just better people who can, can get you in on the ground level and yeah. explain to you how it yeah, works. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's many dimensions to diversity, too. I mean, you, you looked at the sort of gender parity issue, mm -hmm. but obviously that's not the only problem. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's, like, I think a nested problem, which I think is relevant to people in the room here, and that is we've got tons of cultural boards around here who do not have creators, artists, on their boards. I do. And, <laughs> and, and, well, I can tell you for a fact, yeah. and, and, I, and I know in, in one case, um, man, did I have to push... Uh, to, to uh, and I kept getting comments like, well, you know, will the art, the artists aren't, they're not going to want to sit around a boardroom, like, it's like, oh, for God's sake, am I really hearing this? No, they're not going to want to sit, yes, they are going to want to sit around, they care. Well, I know, but there's so much, you know, it's a lot of time they can phone in. Like, it, it was just like one myth after another. But, you know, I think, you know, you could look around at a lot of the, uh, disasters that have happened in the culture, like I'm thinking, I don't know, Soul Pepper, um, maybe a artist or two, a, you know, somebody on that board, would that have changed it? Um, you know, and I know I can speak for, you know, Massey, I'm on the board of Massey Hall, Roy Thompson, and we have an artist on our board, and I hope we'll have another. Um, but, but I think it, a lot of it is, it goes back to the question, you know, so what can you do? Uh, will you act with intentionality? Um, now, my friend Rocco's here in the room with me from the Ontario Chamber of Commerce. I was the chair there uh, until recently, just left as past chair. But in the past three or four years, we went from a board that was predominantly, I think it was, I forget what the number is, like 15, 7 men to women, and flipped it. Hmm. Just completely flipped it. How do you do that? You just you just say no to a lot of very qualified uh, male applicants and say yes to equally qualified female applicants who are out there and I don't think people are looking hard enough. Mm -hmm. So, and now I can just... Hear, you know. okay. mm -hmm. I, and, and, I, and I should I should also speak to our own experience at, at Music Canada because um, we we have a board that is made up of the presidents of the three record companies, um, and that's sort of in the constitution of the agreement. Now, when there were five record companies, there were five, and when there were six, there were six. Um, they weren't always men. In fact, there was a period in time when I think three of them were women. So it just sort of depends. But right now, it's men. Uh, and uh, so we wanted to do something about that. And usually one of the things that you hear in these discussions is, well, 
my bylaws won't let me do anything. Well, freaking change the bylaws. So that's what we did. We changed our bylaws. We increased the, the size of our board to five, um, and, which diluted the voting uh, uh, power of the three members who write the checks for my organization and have created two positions for outside directors, one of whom is uh, Jennifer Sloan over there from, uh, from MasterCard. <laughs> and Jen, I, I will say it is not a, a, a shred of a lie to say that with you in the room, and this is what they always say about uh, you know, diversified boards, conversation's better. Wouldn't you agree, Steve? Conversation's better, outcomes are better, everything's better. Um, so thank you. Um, and, and we're looking for a, a fifth. The other thing that we did... That's a good, you know, giving a shout out, right? Yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> um, yeah, that's right, we are. Um, and, uh, and, and the other thing that we did was we created an advisory council uh, of, uh, of uh, folks from across the music industry, which gave us a chance to be even more diverse. So we've ended up with a, a, a 15 people, eight women, seven uh, men, uh, five artists, uh, seven people of color, uh, and it sort of crosses the spectrum in the country, and they advise me on what we're doing. How are we doing? And they come to the table with ideas. Here's things that you should study. You should spend money here. You're, you're missing this. And I can tell you that the, the first meeting that we had, I don't know, they generated like 80 ideas. And we're boiling them down, and then we're gonna do something. But unless you get that diversity of thought, you're just stuck in a rut. Yeah. Makes it a lot more interesting. Oh, God, yeah. It makes, makes yeah. it stronger in the end. Like that, that's, that's essentially what comes out from, from all of this. Is yeah. a, we, we need to have those broader conversations and we need to have more inclusive conversations. Mm -hmm. That's in fact what makes us stronger. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, we have time for questions. Um, I, I don't know where we are in our schedule. Um, we're good? So questions were written down. Oh man, uh, you got them all. Well, no, I'm pro they're pro they look like they're for you actually. Um, <laughs> Um, so we have a question uh, from uh, Maddie Oliver, is that correct? Hey Maddie, uh, uh, who's a Humber student. Um, uh, as a music business student at Humber, my question is, what do you feel are the opportunities in the music business for someone graduating later this year? Uh, what skills are important uh, such, in such a rapidly changing industry? I would think that's... That may be me. That might be you. Yeah, that might be you. <laughs> Uh, I mean, you might so, want my advice. Why don't I, I'll, I'll, but I, I'll, well, let me, let me just, let me, let me answer that, Maddie. So um, I, I would start by saying that this is a good time to be graduating. It's, it's a hell of a lot better than five years ago or 10 years ago. Um, and the fact is that life is coming back into the industry, that revenues are going up. Uh, that the market is diversifying. It, that, by the way, contains challenges because Canada no longer occupies its traditional place as the sixth largest market in the world. We're now behind South Korea. Uh, we're going to lose ground to China and uh, and other. And once that happens, you know, we're we're dropping out of uh, of may, maybe even out of the top ten. But nonetheless, there's there's increased revenue. There's international opportunities, and, and I, I guess what I would say is. Um, it's an all digital business now, pretty much. Um, it's not that we don't, uh, uh, don't make money selling vinyl and analog product, but that's a skill set that you really have to master and, and make your own. Um, so the, 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 uh, the opportunities are there. There are, you know, people are hiring, which you wouldn't have, just, that wouldn't have been happening five years ago. Uh, so there's, there's reason for optimism. Um, Okay, so let's, so here's one uh, from Patricia O'Callaghan uh, at that table there. As an artist, Patricia says, it's encouraging to see both industry and government recognizing the source of the value gap and recommend solutions. My question is, and I think this can be for you, definitely, as artists, what else can we do to help ensure these solutions actually become implemented? And it probably goes back to some of your previous yeah. advice. Uh, I would say keep, keep pushing. Uh, and, 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 you know, that's the most important thing is, so we have the Heritage Committee report, we have this report from Music Canada, we have growing awareness, uh, but we need the two parts, and, and the public education piece that I was referring to about consumers understanding uh, the value gap, I don't believe that many do, um, so making sure that we get 
consumers across our country to understand and to say, you know, when, when you're just downloading from YouTube, that, that money isn't getting back to your artist. Uh, that, that part, like just that they understand how that works. And as well, reaching out to your electeds. Say it all orders of government, really. Like it, it, I mean, federal plays a role on the copyright piece, but all orders of government know that it's important to have a strong creative industry. So, and, and to the extent that you're comfortable, bring those personal stories forward. Uh, bring those personal stories forward because it's good for industry and mm -hmm. places like Music Canada to be able to gather up the data but, but adding some, uh, it's funny, I'm vegetarian, but I'll say it's some meat to those bones. <laughs> um, you know, just, it helps, right? It, it helps to, to bring it to life. And certainly in the course of the Heritage Committee mm -hmm. report, that's really what we tried to do was to highlight as much as possible where we could quotes from the artists to try and show what the impact was. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, different levels of government. Uh, I can certainly think back to a time when really the only level of government that, it in, that did intersect uh, with the community was the federal government. But you're right, uh, today uh, provincial governments and uh, even municipal governments are seeking ways to, you know, unlock the magic of music yeah. in their creative community. Absolutely. Um, and, and that's probably, uh, you know, there's a role there for artists as well um, on advisory committees. I mean, Toronto has a, uh, a Toronto Music Advisory Council, which it never had before, and other cities are slowly adding them. So. Yeah. And, and that's what one of the things that makes our city great, is all the mm -hmm. music that we have in our city. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an interest in keeping that, keeping that going, keeping that alive. So I'm, I'm not taking away from the federal responsibility mm -hmm. here. Absolutely push hard on the federal side of things, but, but let's bring everyone to that table. Um, I, I just want to ask, because it's about a, a sort of a supplement on that, is um, so we come back after the election, um, there's going to be steps that we have to take, we have to stay together, all that kind of stuff. Um, but is there, um, will there be additional hearings or, you know, like we had, the, yeah. I mean, I have to say one of the offensive things about the, you know, to comment uh, about the industry was their first recommendation was, please don't make us do this again. Uh, well, you know what, we're going to make you do it again mm -hmm. and we're going to keep making you do it again until you fix it. Yeah. Um, but is there... You see, uh, my, my hope, my yeah. hope would be that that what you would be seeing at that point is that you'd be back at committee hearings because we'd be reviewing legislation, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I'm not saying that if you have to go back, we go back. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, really, the best place for us to be, mm -hmm. if we were looking at it, is that there's new legislation tabled. Then you go back to committee and you have to, at that point, push to make sure that right. voices are heard as to, you know, does it need to be amended? What's the best Right, so I guess you assume that something's going to happen. I mean, they're not going to do nothing, we would hope. We would um, hope, yeah. So, so, yeah, that's right. So then something's going to get drafted by somebody somewhere deep in the boiler works, <laughs> and then it will come back to your committee, won't it? Uh, or, it is, or industry. It yeah, or, yeah. On, yeah. Mm -hmm. More likely copyright legislation would go to industry. Right. Well, maybe you should get chair of industry. <laughs> we that. Talk about that. Um, so, uh, uh, how are we doing for time? Two minutes? Uh, well, you know what, because it was another question for me, um, and I don't want to dominate this, so I won't uh, answer you that. You can. Well, <laughs> uh, well, it says it's from Darlene Tanelli. Is Darlene out there? Darlene's a, a, a lawyer who's been uh, long in our, our business and she's a terrific advocate as well for, for uh, artists. She says, you shared some rather startling figures about the scale of the value gap, uh, which uh, without action will continue to grow. Of the recommendations in your report, oh, which would have the most impact in closing the value gap? Well, that's so, so that there, there is an interesting answer there because, and I'm, uh, I mean sort of interaction there, uh, in that some of the things that we asked for we're fairly straightforward. Like there's that 1.25 million exception. The there's the sound recording exception, which according to industry, apparently you don't want. <laughs> Miranda, you don't want to make money from that. And they also, they don't seem to have the understanding. Like there seemed to be this, this paranoia that- oh, We've brought well, you back we, to a dark place. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll create this right and there'll be money and then the record companies will all get it. It's like dudes. It's like a remunerative right. It'll go to ReSound, it'll be split 50-50, and everybody gets their money. Uh, so they don't even seem to understand how their own Copyright Act works, which is alarming. Um, but 
uh, yeah, I think, so, so that, I think there were very granular things that ha had those recommendations about that uh, and, uh, and, and others, had they been enacted, um, there would have been an immediate impact, like, like those royalties would start accruing immediately. Um, the, the copyright board reform oh, yes. did happen. I mean, just a, it's not part of this mm -hmm. part, but that is something that actually did happen yeah. and should have more immediate impact. So yeah, I, I agree. That's a, you know what? Not enough credit has been given to the government for copyright board reform, which sounds like really esoteric. Mm -hmm. But I will say that one comment that was made to me by an international uh, um, member of the international music community was reforming the boards that set rates and bringing them into the 21st century is the single most important step to proper valuation of our rights. So kudos to the, in this case, industry committee for doing something that, that would have an impact. There you go. So I think it's those two, but very clearly, you know, there's bigger issues and I don't know how we get our arms around them because they involve, you know, the platform accountability issue. So. There you go. Well, on that note, that's not a bad place to end, though. That's no, <laughs> no, it's not. Um, well, uh, so I guess we're being. Oh, yeah. So wait, I'll just. I just want to. <laughs> we get the hook. Thank you. I think it's just for you. <laughs> she deserves a standing ovation. Oh, no, thank you. <laughs> <Larry>. <laughs> Thank you. You guys are all awesome. <laughs>